with Hashem's loving grace, tonight we are going to be learning about the first Noahide commandment. We've had two introductory lessons to the seven Noahide commandments and the relationship to the 13 principles of Amuna and how all the Noahide commandments are based in Amuna. We're going to continue with the theme of Amuna in the Noahide commandments that was throughout all our lessons. And this is what we concentrate in because without Amuna, you can't fully com- com- fulfill any commandment of the Torah and especially the seven Noahide commandments. And we'll, we'll learn in, in continuation that seven are actually more than 30, but with basic seven. Tonight, we're number one. We're going to discuss the first Noahide commandment, which is the prohibition of idolatry. So why do we give the first commandment, the prohibition of idolatry? Don't do this. Okay, the, well, what do I do? We're going to discuss that. Okay, to understand the point, the physical world, it's a one big tangible metaphor for the spiritual world. That, that we can, the spiritual world, we can't understand it without the physical world. By seeing the way the Almighty created the physical world, we can understand the spiritual world. This you can understand what it says, the Torah says in Genesis, that all of us were created in the divine image. Well, wait a second, that contradicts the Rambam's third principle of Amuna, that the Almighty has no physical properties, no, no physical attributes. But this is, again, it's a metaphor. The divine image is a metaphor that us understand something about the divine because we're all children of Hashem. Okay, so we say the physical world is a metaphor for the spiritual world, and we learn about the spiritual world from tangible lessons that the physical world teaches us. And the Noahide laws are no exception. And I'm going to explain why. Let's let's understand something that we all learned in physics, and I'll explain it simply. And we can understand the Noahide laws according to this. Okay, so uh, in physics, there's no such thing as an absolute vacuum. You can't have a space that has no matter, no energy, and it's like a vacuum pack free of oxygen. No such thing as 100% devoid of oxygen. Okay, so there's no such thing as an ac- ac- absolute vacuum. So even the vacuum packed product that you buy at the supermarket has got gases in it. And the proof is if it didn't have gases, it would have shelf life forever. But the fact that it does have some gases in it, even a vacuum packed product is limited in shelf life, requires refrigeration. Okay, so for years, manufacturers and food packagers, they they tried valiantly to create some type of absolute vacuum environment that would increase shelf life and remove the oxygen because the oxygen triggers food spoilage. Just like what's rust? Rust is oxidation of metal. And the same thing happens we have in our, in our body. When we get older, the body is oxidated. So this would take antioxidants, all kinds of good food, fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. They're antioxidants and they work to keep the body young, body fresh and keep the body from oxidation. The same goes in, 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 in food. Oxidation, it spoils organic material. All right. So the manufacturers, the food engineers and the packaging engineers, their goal was to create an oxygen free environment. And they didn't fully succeed because uh, the high rate of return products when a salesman would come to the store, uh, the, the store owner would give her these packages, they, they wouldn't take it back. And uh, this would cause manufacturers a big loss. But uh, this bore witness that there's no such thing as absolute vacuum. So what happened? Uh, the manufacturers gave up and in the early 1980s, they discovered something new. Uh, food packaging engineers then acknowledged the principle that uh, oxygen void package is impossible to obtain, just a vacuum. So they did a new process. They called nitrogen flushing. Instead of trying to get rid of the oxygen, they inject nitrogen and the nitrogen pushes the oxygen out, but the package is full of nitrogen gas. Now, nitrogen doesn't spoil food, but it retards oxygen. And this is what we have in our vacuum packs now. It doesn't look like skin tight, like vacuum pack, but you see something that has a, it's nitrogen flushed and its shelf life is much longer. And this was much more successful, but just simply nitrogen placing the oxygen. So the nitrogen gas fills the package, it creates a cushion, and it prevents the food from spoiling. And food doesn't react with nitrogen the way it reacts with oxygen, and so it keeps it fresh. Okay, so in a nutshell, the process works like this. And once again, we're going to learn the first Noahide principle from this, from this process. Okay, food is placed inside a package prior to flushing with uh, nitrogen. And then a packaging machine puts, injects nitrogen in the package and then seals it hermetically. And the oxygen is forced out of the package. And once the space inside the vacuum 
there's been, inside the package been filled with nitrogen, then the bag is sealed. Okay. So what do we learn from that? We learn from that, okay, people, they say they're atheists. They don't believe in anything. Okay. They don't believe in anything. No, there's no such thing as atheists. You see, if it, a person has to believe in something or else he can't live. And here's the truth. Here's what happens. So imagine that what I tell you all about the vacuum, imagine that atheism is the spiritual counterpart of the vacuum. In other words, just have you some place that doesn't have any oxygen, try to play some place that doesn't have a Shem's light, some place that doesn't have the Almighty. And so it gave us a Malaz Kavodo that Shem's glory fills the whole earth. And so that right away debunks that. But just imagine the atheists are looking for some place or and they, they don't believe in a Shem and they, they can't they have a Shem in the world. So even I'll prove that they're wrong, even the most stalwart atheist, the most diehard atheist, atheist, he believes in something. What's he believe in? He believes in the supremacy of nature. Okay. Now you tell the atheist, you say, excuse me, Mr. Atheist, do you believe that the sun is going to rise tomorrow? He says, yes, could be some, well, you can't see it. How do you know the sun's going to rise tomorrow? Well, the sun rose yesterday and the day before, so it's going to rise tomorrow. So they, he believes. And say, hey, wait a second, do you believe in the order of the zodiac? That, oh, yeah, he believes in the order of the zodiac. Why well, believe it? Because every year they have the same order. Every night they have the same order. Take an atheist that works on Wall Street or in the futures market in London or in Chicago. Now, suppose he, well, where's the trade? He sits in his Wall Street Manhattan office. And he buys carloads of corn, and the corn is in Iowa. But he doesn't see the corn, and he doesn't see the carloads. But yet, he puts a lot of money on the table, and he buys it. He doesn't see either one. But he believes, he's got a system, he believes that something is backing up his money. And he does show, he contradicts himself. You see, sir, you do believe in something you don't see. Okay, that's a, this joke in, in America, they write on the dollar, they say all kinds of laws in modern America that they can't say the Pledge of Allegiance, and they, they deny the fact of one nation under God and the founding fathers, and the, the, which are written in the, the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so they write on the, in, in God we trust. Where's the, where they write in America in God we trust? In the dollar. My very good friend, Ray Moore, he was head justice, head justice in Alabama. He's a head justice, and they he got disbarred because he put a statue of the Ten Commandments on his courthouse in Montgomery, Alabama. And the Supreme Court says, take it down. And he said, no, this is, this is, the, this is the, the tradition of the founding fathers. I'm going to take down the Ten Commandments? I shall not steal, I shall not kill? He said, I'm not going to take it down. So they disbarred him. They disbarred him. And then he was reelected again and then disbarred again. And really, a believer, a believer in God. But we once did a radio show together in, in Israel National Radio. I interviewed him on, on my show on International Radio. Really, we became, became good friends. But uh, it just said, okay, in, in the United States, you can't put the Ten Commandments on your courthouse. No, no, that's going to be insulting. But you're right, in God we trust on the dollar. So who's the God we trust? The United States, when I was a little kid, before 1964, the United States used to have what's called a silver certificate. When you had a dollar, theoretically, you could take that dollar and you could go to Fort Knox and you could say, I want a silver coin or I want a, a gold dollar. And they had to give you, if it was a gold certificate, then a silver certificate. They th This was a guarantee, a promissory note from the American government that your money was backed up in gold and silver. And therefore, America couldn't print all the money they wanted. It was really low. They, Years and years and years and years, there was low inflation because if they didn't have gold or silver in Fort Knox, they couldn't print more money. They could only print as much money as they have gold and silver in Fort Knox. And that was the amount of money in America. Okay, but then the politicians was enough for them. So in 1964, they scanned, they, they, they canned the, the silver, the silver certificate it says on the, on the dollar, silver certificate, then no longer. And now it says Federal Reserve note. To this day, Federal Reserve note. Federal Reserve note is a promissory note from the American government that they will honor you for whatever currency, what the, whatever denomination is written on that currency, whether it's one or 10 or, or 20 or $100, okay? But really, it's a mere piece of paper. Nothing backs up American currency. So tomorrow, the Department of Treasury in Washington, they could decide to print more dollars, print more dollars, print more dollars. And it doesn't, the, the gross national product of America, it's not getting bigger, but just getting more and more and more and more. 
So here, even to use a dollar, you have to believe in the integrity of the U.S. economy. Now, where do you see this? You don't see this in America because you live here. But outside of America, where there's foreign currency trading, the value of the dollar goes up and down according to what foreign banks have belief in the dollar. They believe in the American economy. In other words, if the American economy is inflationary and they don't believe it, then the dollar is going to go down. People don't want to buy dollars. They don't want to invest in dollars. All right. So to use dollars, you have to believe in the American economy. Otherwise, uh, there are a lot of people that they, they throw away, they don't believe, they believe the American economy is at the pits and they, they buy, I know people that buy gold and put it in Swiss banks, buy gold in Swiss banks and, and get it outside of America. So they don't believe in the American economy. Okay. So in uh, principle one of the 13 principles of Amuna, the in lack of principle one, in other words, if we don't believe that Hashem alone did, does, and will do everything, as we learned last week, if we don't believe in principle one, the first principle of Amuna, then the dollar could easily become a deity. Because the dollar, look at the power. You can do anything with the dollar. You could buy, you could sell, and you can run people and the power and buy people, people that are, that are rich. And it looks like a dollar. For, for she's a, they're going again, for, facetiously. People say that, you know, the United States writes in God we trust on the dollar because so much of liberal America, they don't believe in God, but they believe in the dollar. So the dollar is the deity. And they answer their own question by saying that, okay, so many people believe that the dollar is a God. So you're not an atheist. It's just in this, in this situation, God is your idolatry. Because if you believe in anything other than Hashem, if you believe that your health comes from the doctor or your income comes from your boss or anything other than Hashem, then it, it's idolatry. It, it, it's a foreign worship. Idolatry really means foreign worship. We call it in Hebrew, avoid the zola. Avoid the zola is worship of anything other than the Almighty. Now, Rabbi Nachman of explains that a person who harbors a lust for money, in fact, he worships money. And prove this. Okay, suppose that uh, a person falls under the dark side of spirituality. Okay, the spirituality is no, there's no gray. You know, the, the good side, the light side, or the dark side? Okay, so the dark side, we call in Aramaic and the Kabbalah is Tzitrachra. It's the other side, the other side, the opposite of holiness. Our side this is the side of holiness. Now, since money, if money becomes supreme in a person's mind, then that person will violate all the Ten Commandments one by one in order to get money. Because what is he? He wants money. All right. But the Almighty says that you can't kill and you can't steal and you're not allowed to covet. Oh, the guy certainly covets. Go one by one, one by one. And he won't keep the Sabbath. He needs money. He can't close the store on Sabbath. Okay. So he break the Sabbath. One by one, one by one, because he says, oh, this, this Torah, these Ten Commandments, they're so limiting. I can't make enough money what I want. So he puts aside the Almighty's law and he declares himself supreme above the Almighty. There's no greater idolatry. So we can see any time a person puts aside the Almighty, and it's absolute law that the Almighty gave us 3,448 years ago on Mount Sinai and to, to most on Mount Sinai and puts that aside and chooses his own will this is serving other than the Almighty, which is simply idolatry. Okay, maybe he doesn't build a statue of himself and put it in his front lawn, but he is serving himself and he's not serving the Almighty. So when we elaborate on the above teaching, we look at the writings of Rebbe Nachman's great pupil, Rebbe Nathan of Breslov. Rebbe Nathan of Breslov, he therefore says that honest negotiations constitute a negotiation into a moon of negotiations. When a person negotiates honestly, he's saying, okay, he believes, and he only believes that he can't shortchange a, a customer or shan't shortchange a worker. He can't take a penny that doesn't belong to him. It's not to do. And then this is this is this individual. I understand a lot of people they roll their eyes and they be the big, big religious and big holy rollers. If you want to see a really God-fearing person. Look for a person whose negotiations are fair, whose word is word. He's honest. He's fair. This is a person with real belief, okay? Doesn't have to have a long beard or long black coat, any of that stuff, none of the trappings. 
watch if you look such a business person like that just a business person like that if you take a good look and for someone to have spiritual eyes and you'll see that an honest business person like that reflects the divine countenance he had a divine light because he lives he or she lives their amuna and this is the result of amuna because it's the amuna their belief in the almighty that enables them to do honest business and just imagine what society would be if everybody believed in the almighty and if nobody did idolatry not an idol not themselves and anything nobody thought they could override the ten commandments everybody believed the ten commandments everybody believed that the almighty gave the torah to moses on sinai everybody believes that you can't rob and you can't steal and you can't lie and you can't covet and you can't touch the neighbor's spouse and everybody believes in this what a society it's a <laughs> shangri-la it's a paradise on earth this is the whole thing we spoke about in our very first lesson. The whole purpose of the Noahide laws is a beautiful society. Look, our society is so sick. You just every day, every time you turn on the news, it's sickening to open the news that there's been another mass shooting, another this, and it's crazy. So try to visualize the light of Amuna as positive energy that illuminates the soul that brings true happiness, that illuminates the world in a good manner. It's like sunlight that makes it causes photosynthesis and makes plant grow. On the other hand, imagine that the lack of amuna, and it's lack of amuna, lack of amuna is, is, turns right into idolatry. It's spiritual darkness and it's negative energy. You have either positive energy or the negative energy. We see this in the, you have protons, neutrons, what happens with a negative energy when a person has anxiety and a person has fear and a person is depressed that is all from negative energy and people ask what do they do about their anxiety what do they do with their fear the pills aren't going to help the psychiatrist is going to help the only thing to get rid of the negative energy and the negative emotions is emuna to connect the soul to the almighty, connect it to positive energy, the light, illuminate the soul, and the soul feels great. How does the soul collect to, to, to the almighty? By talking to the almighty. We spoke all about that in our language of Amuna. Now, since Amuna and idolatry, they're mutually exclusive. They cannot go together. They're oil and water, light and dark. They can't, can't go together. The first Noahide law that we're talking about tonight that prohibits idolatry it's actually a law that obligates Amuna. And if anyone ever said it, but this is, a, this is a, what I prepared this lesson. And I said, wait a second. The Noahide law, the, the Gomorrah says it's a prohibition of idolatry, but you can't stay away from idolatry. You need something to fill the void. And so that's for Amuna. And I took the whole lesson and went to the Melitza Rebbe. And my, my teacher, my holy teacher, said, Rebbe, this is what I came up with. Okay, tell me if it's on the truth. It's, 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 it's the truth. And Rebbe said, 100%. 100%. A person, a Noahide, there's no difference between a Noahide and a Jew when it comes to the first of the Ten Commandments that this is the Lord our God. And that's the commandment of Amuna. Okay, because a law that prohibits idolatry, it necessarily obligates Amuna. Now, the Ten Commandments say this in one and two. Number one, I am the Lord your God. And number two, you have no other God before me. Okay, the Noahide law took this and put this in the one that actually, it see, we have eight Noahide laws, but say the first two commandments, the first two Noahide laws, but the first two commandments, the Ten Commandments, are actually the first Noahide law. Okay, so without a Muna, this is why you need a Muna. If a person doesn't have a Muna, a person is liable to fall into all types of idolatry, and some in very subtle forms. Uh, again, there's no vacuum. So where there's no amuna, idolatry fills the void. Just like you have, there's no, there's no such thing as absolute vacuum. So there's no such thing as absolute spiritual vacuum. So the person says, okay, you're not allowed to have adultery, but something has to fill the void. If a person wants to stay away from adultery, has to fill his life with something. What is it? Amuna. That's amuna. And that's why amuna, and that's why our, our lessons are for, for all mankind. They, they, they're not for, for, for all mankind. For, People around him, the Noahide laws, and when we we speak about Amuna, they're for everybody. 
They're for everybody, for all, all of humanity, and it's for all the world. Okay, so any type, any slightest denial of God, that's that's right away idolatry, right? Uh, Hashem doesn't need help in running the world. So what does idolatry do? Idolatry contradicts the exclusive belief in one true God and worshiping him only. So a person that worships anything other than Hashem, he denies the first principle of Amuna that Hashem is creator and director of every living thing, and he alone did, does, and will do everything. So that's the creator, blessed be his name. It's the first principle of Rambam, the first of 13 principles. Okay, so furthermore, idolatry, it's a heinous violation of principle two, the second principle of Muna, where we declare a complete belief that the creator, blessed be his, be his name, is one, and there is no unity like him under any circumstances. And he alone, he alone is our God, past, present, and future. Okay, uh, cherish friends, cherish brothers, sisters. Tonight's lesson is not politically correct, but it's truth. All right. What does it mean? I'm very sorry, and I don't mean to insult anybody. We're talking about pure Torah, that when we say he alone, means Hashem doesn't need any help. Okay, Hashem doesn't need helpers, and Hashem doesn't need trinities, and Hashem doesn't need uh, sons with 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 the divine power. Hashem doesn't need all these things that that the whole world is running after. Okay, idolatry. It's also a, a, we'll could elaborate on this. Idolatry is also a violation of principle five, which teaches that Hashem is the only entity to whom it is befitting to pray, and it's not befitting to pray to anyone or to anything else. In other words, we don't ask any flesh and blood entity for salvation or, or this. We have to accept some kind of flesh and blood entity. That No way. So these three principles, principle one, that Hashem alone did, does, and will do. And principle two, that Hashem is one and there's no unity like him. And principle five in our 13 principles of Amuna, maybe we'll go back and, and refer to our uh, book 13 principles of Amuna, which we all learned one by one. Uh, that it's only befitting to pray to Hashem. You know what happens when we have these three principles of Amunah? This way you need the 13 principles of Amunah to learn Noahide laws. Once you take these three principles of Amunah from Maimonides, from the Rambam, and put it together, it debunks any concept of a new religion that's based on any other thing other than the one true God who revealed himself on Mount Sinai. Now, Hashem alone did, does, and will do every deed since the beginning of time to this very moment and Hashem needs no help. Now, we learned in the third principle of Muna that Hashem has no physical properties, nothing. You can't make a, a statue about Hashem. You can't make a symbol about Hashem. You can't do anything. Okay, throughout history, the masses, the great masses, and, you know, it's funny, throughout history, monotheists, we've been a tiny, tiny little minority. And the whole world has been on our back. The whole world has been uh, persecuting us, all right? Why the whole world, they're, they're into idolatry. And when we don't want to accept it, oh, why do you have to, why do you have to kill somebody that disagrees with you? Oh, but they, they sure did. <laughs> the, the Christians in the Crusades, that they, they, they massacred half of European Jewry, the, the Muslims, and, and there, that they, they, they it, it's crazy. Uh, Okay, throughout history, the masses had difficulty in clinging to pure Muna. Okay, they needed something tangible to cling to. So they attributed divine powers to flesh and blood. They, they gave the well, flesh and blood, they gave them divine powers. Okay, so they had a few dimensions and they made a flesh and blood savior and they made a trinity and they made all kinds of, all kinds of new inventions. Well, both a flesh and blood savior and a trinity, they are idolatrous concepts that contradict the third principle of Amuna. I believe with complete belief that the creator, blessed be his name, is not a body, nor can any physical entity comprehend him. He is incorporeal with no image whatsoever. They can't accept anything that comes with, with uh, uh, the... the, 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 the person that you have to worship. Okay. Shem doesn't need any partnership either. Some people think that partnership is okay. It's called in Hebrew shituf. 
that you can believe in a sham, but along with the sham comes, you know, along with your, your chicken, you get French fries and a salad. No, it's not like that. You get a sham only and, and no side dishes. A sham doesn't need any help and he doesn't have any physical attributes like the Rambam teaches in the third principle of Muna. But some seem to think that partnership, once again, it's a concept known as shituf. Uh, it's permissible. In other words, they believe in God. Yeah, they believe in God. There's a, you just see a, a religious Christian, they're all, what are you talking about? Of course they believe in God. Yeah, and that, yeah, they believe in the, the Old Testament, sure, but they make a little addition, the New Testament. And you ask to, uh, a Muslim, you believe in God? You say, of course he believes in God. Allahu Akbar, of course, there's only, only one God. In fact, we'll, we'll see that the Islam is more pure monotheism than Christianity. But the problem is, is there are new guys on the block. There are new guys on the block. There's no new religion after Mount Sinai. And the reason that we can't with the, keep the Noahide commandments is because Moses brought down the commandment from Hashem that we have to keep the Noahide commandments. In other words, we don't keep the Noahide commandments because they're moral, they're the right thing to do, because Hashem commanded them. So if there were a new religion, and even the new religion would come along and say, you know something, these seven commandments are very moral, they're very logical, let's keep them. No, we don't keep them because they're logical or moral, but we keep them because the Almighty commanded them. So uh, these people that believe in the partnership, they believe in the Almighty, but they attribute all types of things. They have the kind of flesh and blood son that he made a ascension and he's got divine attributes to have to worship. And, and if you don't believe in him, you're going to burn and do all kinds of silly things. And these are clearly idolatrous codes. Maybe one of the biggest authorities on halacha, the Noahide laws today, is Rabbi Moshe Weiner. Rabbi Moshe Weiner wrote a classic book called Divine Code. It's a very too thick volume book. The seven he elaborates every tiny detail of the seven Noahide laws. And that's not our purpose here. Our purpose is to teach them according to principles of Amuna. But he says clearly, he says clearly that all the Christian concepts, it's all idolatry. And the concept of partnership, it's a violation of the Noahide law that prohibits idolatry. Check out chapter six in the Divine Code by Rabbi Moshe Weiner. And all, therefore, all the ceremonial uh, rituals are forbidden. Now, if you bow down to the symbols like uh, a, a, a statue or a cross and bowing down to any of that stuff, that's all forbidden. And we have, once again, reemphasize that there's no, there's a prohibition against any new religion, no new religion. So a person might argue, the opposed to Christianity, Islam doesn't violate that. A lot of people argue Islam doesn't violate, no, they bring, they, they, they bring a proof. For example, and if you've been to Jerusalem and you go up to Ramot above Jerusalem, there is the tomb of Samuel the prophet. Today, the tomb of the Samuel prophet in the Middle Ages, they built a mosque on top of it. Well, in the basement, it's where the tomb is, where Samuel the prophet's tomb is, there's a synagogue. They said, wait a second, what, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you praying inside a mosque for? The same thing goes in Hebron, the Machpelah cave. The, the Muslims built a mosque on top of the Machpelah cave where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, and Rebecca and Leah are buried, but there's a synagogue there. So there's no problem praying in a synagogue with a mosque, but you can't do that inside a church because there is no idolatry. The problem with, with Islam is not that it's idolatry. In fact, it's a new religion. It came along Muhammad and uh, Muhammad that not that long ago, <laughs> that long ago, 1300 years ago, and he, he saw the light. The difference between Muhammad and the Israelites on Mount Sinai, there were two million of them, together with Moses, that saw the revelation of Hashem. And notice all these new religions, there's one person that saw the light. This person saw the light and people believed him and he was charismatic and maybe powerful. Like a Muhammad, he went through all South Arabia. There used to be a lot of Jews after the destruction of the Second Temple in Saudi Arabia and Yemen killed them all. Oh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't accept him. They wouldn't accept me. You're a new guy in the block, you're a new religion. We're not gonna listen to you. Okay, then you die by the sword. And that's why they live by the sword. 
and the Jews. So anyone, Rabbi Weiner writes in chapter six, anyone who creates a new religion denies the com command of God to all nations to keep the seven wide commandments. And he transgresses the, essence, the essential commandment of them all. So even if a new religion, such as Islam, which is only 1,350 years old, or Christianity, which is less than 2,000 years old, it, it includes observing the Noahide commandments. Even if, they, even if they did include observing the Noahide commandments, they're not being observed because Hashem commanded Moses. He read his revelation of Moses because of the newly created religion. And we don't practice the Noahide commandments because of the new religion. All right. So there's any new religion, and there's many, many more. I wanted to talk about this, not a course in comparative religion, but uh, it's not that, that's not our cup of tea. Okay, it's not Hashem's cup of tea either. So what's the positive? Let's talk about the positive side. All right. But I had to talk about this and illustrate, and I know it's not popular, and uh, maybe take flack, but I'm sorry, but this is the truth of Torah, and we don't mix words. These are the Noahide laws. Now teach him. So the Almighty's revelation to Moses and to over 2 million Israelites on Mount Sinai, it took place in the Hebrew year of 2448, which is 1312 BC. And this was the occasion when the Jewish people received the Torah. This is this holiday is next week. It's uh, next Thursday night and Friday, the, the, the holiday of Shavuot, we receive the Torah. So our ninth principle, the ninth of the 30 principle of Muna states, I believe with complete belief that this is the Torah, what we received on Sinai, it shall not be replaced, and with the, nor will the Creator, blessed be He, make a new Torah, give us a different Torah. As such, neither, according to our ninth principle, Muna, neither the Quran nor the New Testament they can qualify as Torah. Sorry. So, but interestingly, they, they, they say this, these were revelations of one person that was an elaborated, elaborated, elaborated. And uh, if people accepted that Muhammad Yusuf knew the sword and Richard Lionhearted, that they made a hero out of him in the UK, but that they went through the Crusaders and oh, they knew how to use the sword. Anyone would, wouldn't accept Christianity. That killed, okay, religion of peace. Turn the other cheek. It's, history debunks that. Okay, so not so in Mount Sinai. There are millions of people that heard the Almighty declare, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me. And their souls left them. They couldn't expose that. They cried out to Moses, tell Hashem to stop. Tell him to stop. We can't listen to that. They, they, they felt they had to have, the Midrash tells us that everyone had his guardian angel push his soul back into the body because the soul heard the Almighty's voice. The soul right away was to cling to the Almighty. Bye-bye. I'm out of here. No. I had to go back. And, and so the Almighty gave to Moses this the commandments three to 10, and then he just said them. So uh, why don't we accept any post-Sinai additions or nuances? You see, let's explain this in a matter we call understand. Remember, we talked about our first principle, the manufacturer's manual. Okay, who manufactured the body? The Almighty. Who manufactured the soul? The Almighty. And the Almighty knows what's best for us. Now, the seven Noahide commandments and all the other commandments of Torah, okay, all the light of Amuna. And this is the manufactured, suggested ways to maintain the body and soul and to have a good life. And you can trace any problem in life, any person doesn't have a good life, any nation doesn't have a good life. Uh, look at Russia and Ukraine right now. And look at it. But anywhere you use a strife in the world, it's a deviation from the Noahide laws. Okay, because each of the seven Noahide commandments, particularly the prohibition of idolatry and its positive side, emuna, they illuminate the soul. So when you don't have that, you have darkness and the soul is dark. So avoiding idolatry, and no bigger idolatry than communism, they made themselves, the, 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 the communism was the God. The fact that there's no God, that was the God. There's the, the communists. The communists murdered souls. Communists murdered souls. They said Hitler murdered bodies. But the communists murdered souls. There's this, so anybody that, 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 that came from Russia or came from the USSR, they didn't know that, that, that they couldn't know. Oh, so what, what do they care if you learn Hebrew? What do they care if you keep Shabbos? What do they care if you sing Hebrew? No, can't have anything. They were so afraid of that, that anything would go against their communist doctrine because they made themselves into, into gods. And Bo Hashem, it came back 
our beloved brothers and sisters that came out of the USSR, the Belarus and, 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 and Russia and the Ukraine and, and Latvia and Lita, they came out like spiritual Muslim men. Like it's just like the, the out of the Holocaust from Hitler, they came out with emaciated bodies. Our, our brothers and sisters from Russia to see this with you know, that they came out, the, the Russians stripped them of their neshama. And and if they, they couldn't and they had difficult believing. They had difficult believing it that this is something that to this day, to this day, with our Russian brothers and sisters, it, it, it's a big difficulty. It's a big difficulty. There's a political party here in Israel that thrives on anti-religion, but then they continue that they, because the, the, the Russians, it's as convenient for many of the Russians. On the other stand, like uh, here in Ashdod, here in Ashdod alone, we've got 200 Russian families that just left that and became complete, what we call Balai Chuvas, complete the, co religious Jews from top to bottom. I mean, for years, I, I, I lectured this group, the, the, the tremendous big synagogue, a whole neighborhood of Russian Jews that became the the fully religious and uh you see this is this is the fight that we have told me there's a fight of lightness and darkness even amongst ourselves okay so the light of amuna is a person's personal connection to the creator and each of the seven noahide commandments is illumination it's illumination it helps you illuminate your soul and connect to the creator just imagine that idolatry uh, is chocolate covered poison. The outside maybe tastes nice, uh, idolatry, and, uh, and maybe it's fun or, or this and that. People go to, to Thailand and they have, uh, excuse me, some orgy on the beach, and it's poison for the soul. It's poison for the soul. So idolatry is like spiritual junk food, where emuna is like spiritual health food. Now, maybe you're going to be happy one or two nights eating junk food, but eat junk food for a couple of days, you're not going to be healthy. But if you eat day after day, day after day, day after day, healthy, you're going to be healthy. And if your neshama, your soul, ingests spiritual health food, which is a muna, you're going to be very happy and very healthy. So the Noahide prohibition of idolatry, it's not something prudish to prevent uh, some young people from having a bracanelli on the beach with uh, uh, some kind of idols in Thailand. But people think that ingesting mind-bending narcotics is a fun time they've got all these new drugs and they think that's a fun time uh the heart and the brain and the nervous system they know otherwise no it's not right so there's a lot of fad idolatrous pastimes that for example it used to be and even here in israel used to be that seances were very popular there's no bigger idolatry than seances summoning up the dead and that that spits poison. It's poison for the soul. So when the owl would say chocolate covered poison, when the chocolate covering well, it wears off, then the poison seeps in. Because the Almighty he gave the Noahide commandments to humanity for humanity's own good, for the health of our soul. And we are not doing the Almighty a favor by observing them. We're doing ourselves a favor for our own spiritual and physical health. So talking about okay, that, that, this is that's the whole background between the divide between idolatry and amuna. But let's talk about the practical aspects of it now. Okay, so now that we understand the nature of idolatry, there's a few particular details that we have to stress on this first Noahide commandments. So and every time we're going to learn another Noahide commandment next week, Zohar Hashem, we're going to learn the the prohibition of blasphemy, of, of cursing. Uh, King David said in Psalm 34. Uh, depart from evil and do good. So first we have to get ourselves to, we have to separate ourselves from evil and avoid the slightest, anything that's stained slightly with idolatry and then strengthen our amuna. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the don'ts of idolatry, then talk about the do's. All right, so there's 10 don'ts, 10 don'ts. Okay, number one, do not pray or worship to anyone or anything other than the Almighty. Number two, do not give homage or bow down to any idol, statue, or icon. No, we don't bow down to any of that. Number three, do not make, own, sell, or harbor any statue, idol, icon, or graven image. Number four, do not believe in or attribute independent power to anything other than the Almighty. 
the solar power, oh, the sun's got power. Do people worship the sun? No. The sun's got power because the Almighty gives it power. The sun has no independent power. Person believes in astrology. This constellations have power. No, they don't have any power. The Almighty gives them the power. Okay. Number five, and this is serious. Do not do not engage in any type of soothsaying, sorcery, necromancy. That's a, such as seances. Necromancy is summoning souls of the dead. That is really bad news. Okay. Number six, it's like continuation of five. Do not engage in any act of evoking or calling upon or summoning spirits, or demons, or angels, or supernatural, supernatural, supernatural agents. Now, there's websites where people say, oh, they'll give you the name of your guardian angel, and you can connect with your angel and talk to this angel. But no, only the Shem, only the Shem. We don't talk to angels. Okay. Number seven, do not make an oath or swear in the name of an idol. Number eight, do not believe that planets, constellations, or galaxies determines a person's fate or determine current events. Number nine, do not flatter or acknowledge idolatry or idolaters in any way. No, not supposed to do that. Uh, number 10, do not engage in any type of religious ceremony that is not keeping in the Noahide commandments. In other words, this may be difficult and not popular, and I know a lot of Noahide families have difficulties when they have their relatives, uh, for example, they're practicing Christian relatives that are having some type of celebration in the church and invited to church, and uh, people are doing all kinds of stuff and uh, rosaries and crossing themselves, and you want to do your best to, uh, uh you don't want to be there. Don't want to be there when they're doing that. Okay, so uh, these 10 points, these 10 points are guidelines, and there are many more. But uh, as we'll see, we would compile all this together. This would also be a good uh, little guidebook for Noahide laws. Uh, we're opting in our lessons for brevity and simplicity. Uh, each one of these points, like Rabbi Weiner, when he talks about divine code, divine code is an 800 page book long, and he talks a very rabbinical and very deep. We're talking about practical, something a person can put into practice and only that in relationship to the Noahide laws with the Muna. Okay. Uh, in other words, it's not our job to determine uh, rabbinical law here. It's our job to understand the Noahide laws and how they seeped deep in Amuna, how they're rooted in Amuna, and how they connect us to the Almighty. Okay, so now that anything other than uncompromising belief in the Almighty is idolatry. People ask me, what, if, if you ask me, I'll tell you, 99% Amuna is 100% idolatry. Emunah has got to be 100%. Absolute Hashem. Only Hashem. So if a person has, believes in 99% in Hashem, but 1% he believes in something else, that's it. That's it. That's it. It's got to be 100%. Okay, now the dues. Let's go to the dues. And these are the, okay, the spots of the dues. Put a smile on our face. Number one, make every effort to enhance Emuna to acknowledge and believe in one God. Number two, believe in the truth of God's commandments. Just think of them as the manufacturer, the owner's manual for the soul. Okay, number three, develop an intimate, personal relationship with the Almighty. Wow, if you want to be happy, that's what you do. Imagine the King of Kings, Almighty, 24-7, you could talk to him whenever you want. Whatever you want. You don't have to lie on the sofa. You don't have to pay $350 an hour for somebody who's going to look at his watch and not listen to you. You know, to, to the Almighty. And he can help you like no one else. There's nothing more satisfying. There's no greater declaration of faith than when a person talks to the Almighty. Okay. And, and it's very simple. Three do's and you're home free. So life of Amuna, it's a life of joy and fulfillment. So if you dream of a true love, look for Amuna. Okay. Just think about this dream love. All your life you dreamed of a dream love that you never found, okay, how would you like for someone to love you so much they're they look at your faults and they're totally unjudgmental and they never complain that you're not good enough, they love you the way you are and no strings attached, they don't care how much money you have or how much you don't have, what your status is, what your status is not. And how would you like to love somebody that loves you back a hundred times more than you love him. That's the Almighty. 
it's the Almighty. It's just, it, it just think of it. it. It brings tears of joy in your eyes. Okay, it is. So, how would you like to feel so confident and your love that you never worried, never worried about anything? Yeah, you know, but no matter what I do, no matter what happens, the Almighty loves me. Okay, so I mess up, I spill the milk, okay, I, I bump the fender in, in my, my husband's car, my wife's car. <laughs> Maybe they're going to be angry at my, no, no, well, my beloved child, I'm with you. And that's this small. Well, the big question we ask ourselves is, you know, where, where do we find a love like that? There's only one, one place to look, with the Shem. And that's anybody that's looking for a dream love other than the Shem, they're looking in the wrong place, not going to find it. Not going to find it because you can't have a dream love with flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is inherently selfish and self-serving. Not the Almighty. The Almighty is nothing but giving, giving, giving. The Almighty needs nothing. It needs nothing from us. All giving. All we need to do, we need to thank Him. So the wrong place to look for love is the physical world. That's the wrong place. We won't find anybody that loves us like that in the physical world. But Amuna teaches that we have a loving Father in heaven that is always here for us and always with us. And that is so great and so wonderful. Okay, so King Solomon is the wisest man, the richest man that ever walked the face of the earth. King Solomon had everything. King Solomon had wives. He had concubines. He had riches. King Solomon had like horses. He had a stable full of horses, the best Egyptian horses, best horses in the world. He had money. He had riches. He built this. He built the first temple. He himself lived in a palace. And King Solomon declares, Buzio Vuzulo. He says in Song of Songs that any love other than the love of Almighty, it's nothing. Any riches of the riches of Amuna and one's connected to Almighty, it's nothing. You're talking about an individual that had everything. Been there, done that. King Solomon. So talk about the first Noahide commandment. And we clean ourselves of any semblance of idolatry, have forbid, and strengthen the Amuna. Then we're going to find that love we dream of. And guess what? It's within our reach right now. Right now. So Hashem's waiting for each of us. So as soon as we finish a broadcast, you can turn off, you can talk to Hashem, wherever you are, wherever you are. And there's no greater declaration of Amuna. So where there's a Muna, there's no idolatry. <laughs>